Welcome to Virology Live. This is session number 21. Today we're going to talk about evolution. And perhaps one of my favorite of all the quotes that I use in these lectures around here, it takes all the running you can do just to stay in the same place. Uh, and that, of course, is from Alice in Wonderland. And it is the basis for the Red Queen hypothesis, which we'll look at today. <clears throat> I don't know. Virology on this slide is looking awfully weird on my screen. I don't know why. This all begins, uh, well, it begins a long time ago, but one of the first people to formalize the idea of evolution, of course, was Charles Darwin. And here is a famous page from one of his notebooks where he wrote, he drew a tree, which was his idea of how organisms evolved by observing many of them in the wild, including the finches on the Galapagos Islands. And he wrote, I think, and then drew a tree of uh, branches where organisms are derived from common ancestors. And this is exactly what happens. He didn't know what was actually driving this. He knew nothing about DNA or genes. Um, but that's the beginning of it, the idea that natural selection leads to the evolution of species, of course, today, including viruses. Uh, a number of years ago at a virology meeting in, where was it, London, Ontario, uh, after, the after the day's uh, sessions, I was in a bar, and it was full of virologists, and one of the young ladies had this tattoo on her shoulder. Uh, which, of course, is a reproduction of Darwin's tree. And uh, I asked her if I could take a picture. I asked her permission, and she was delighted. And there's no identifying materials here, as you can see. So what this natural selection is all about is diagrammed on this slide, and it applies to viruses. Viruses are no different from a cow or a fish, or a fly. The only difference is they <laughs> reproduce a lot faster than anything else on the planet. So we'll look at this in terms of a single host protein, because evolution occurs at the level of the gene, and a gene encodes a protein. So we have a host protein in this case that's well adapted to its environment. Now it's abstract. Um, what I'm doing is abstracting it, right? You have to, you have to go with me a bit here. And uh, we the, the environment's blue, and the host protein is a hexagon. One, two, three, four, five, six sides. <laughs> yes. And then at some point, there's a change in the environment. It can be subtle. It could be dramatic. It could be a new host. It could be a slight difference in pH. And this is very important to understand that it doesn't have to be a big deal. It can be just a little bit of a difference in the environment, and that is enough to... Uh, make now this protein maladapted to the environment. Of course, it could be more than one protein, but it's just simpler to think about a single protein. Now, the gene encoding this protein is undergoing mutation, always. Even in DNA-based organisms, it mutates at a certain rate. And at some point, just randomly, there will be a gene encoding this protein made that is slightly different. And now that slightly different protein is better adapted to the new environment, the red environment. So now it's a pentagon. That's that's a big change, a hexagon to a pentagon. But it's just for illustrative purposes, right? It's a very subtle change. Probably a single amino acid would certainly be enough. And this host protein is selected for, it's more fit. Let's get to learn the word fit and fitness instead of transmission. Boy, do I wish people would learn about this. And everyone says, I don't understand fitness. So you understand transmission, so you use a word that's incorrect. And you know what I'm talking about because you've been listening to me for a while now. And yes, with the Omicron variant, it's the, the T word is creeping back into the narrative, unfortunately. Uh, anyway, this new protein is fitter. It's a different protein. It's not a new one. It's fitter for this particular red environment. So it persists offspring with that mutation 
are enriched, they displace the other ones. And in viruses, we can see that happening in real time for organisms that don't reproduce much. It takes many, many years to see this. Now, you can also have changes that occur that are deleterious. And they don't allow for greater fitness. They're actually removed. And that's called purifying selection. You'll see that word used often. It means we're getting rid of alleles or gene or mutations that uh, don't benefit. And in fact, can harm fitness, can reduce fitness. And you can see a signature of that over time for viruses. Uh, and then, of course, uh, this particular change that makes the Pentagon is maintained in this environment because it's beneficial. It confers a fitness advantage. It could also be neutral, and it might be maintained for a while and eventually lost just randomly if it's neutral. A neutral evolution, we call that. But positive selection is when you, a particular change is maintained because it confers some uh, fitness advantage uh, for... Um, that particular organism. All right, so that's what we're talking about here. Natural selection is what Darwin used. We still use that, but it's really adaptation uh, to slightly different environments for a protein. Now, Darwin would have loved viruses. He knew nothing about them. The, the years that he lived and worked, we knew nothing of viruses. Why would he have loved them? Because they are the best exemplars of, of evolution by natural selection. The process that I just told you about, which Darwin studied in animals, can be followed in real time for RNA viruses. That's what we are doing right now for SARS-CoV-2. We are following its evolution in real time. We don't actually know the selective forces that are giving rise to the variants, and we'll talk more about that later. And don't let anyone tell you that we know why they're being selected. People are speculating, but there is as yet no experimental data to demonstrate. And, you know, the problem is that people say this is what's happening, and it's not a conclusion because we don't have data yet, and it will take some years to have the data. So we can watch it now in real time with SARS-CoV-2. Why? Because there's so many people infected, and we're sequencing so many genomes. Uh, and still, we don't know what the selective force is. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a bit. So basically, viral evolution is the constant change of a viral population in the face of selection pressors. For example, today we are going to talk about where viruses came from and where they're going. And both are highly speculative, but nonetheless informative. And before we do that, we'll have to learn some fundamentals, of course. Now, as I've just alluded to, uh, modern virology allows us to understand the mechanisms of evolution actually much better than we can understand them for, um, say, mammals or plants or any other living organism, which reproduce slower. I mean, there's certainly other bacteria and, and yeast and fungi, for example, that reproduce quickly and you can get a window. But the viruses outstrip them all. And therefore, you can watch uh, evolution, as I said, in real time. And you can understand the mechanisms. You can start to understand. We don't know all of the answers yet, but we can start to understand. And here are some of the principles. We learned that as host populations grow and become adapted to their environment, pop virus populations are selected that can infect them. And this is no more obvious than in the development of Homo sapiens, who went from hunter-gatherers living in small bands of individuals with not a lot of contact between uh, the small collections of a few hundred people at the most. Very difficult for a virus to infect them. They probably got them largely from uh, uh, wild animals that they hunted. And when a virus was introduced into them, it uh, eventually changed the population. It might have killed a lot of the people, uh, and the virus may have changed as well. And this, of course, is facilitated by the fact that new viral populations emerge every day. Uh, so we have hosts selecting for viruses, and we have also viruses selecting for hosts. Okay, in the, in the opposite way, viral populations can be significant selective forces in the evolution of host populations, when a new virus is introduced into an immunologically naive population, it can have dramatic effects, as we have seen many millions of people have died of COVID, and it's removing certain genes from the human pool. That's not a great example because we have medicine that removes a lot of the uh, 
uh, negative and positive selection. Uh, so if, uh, if a host population can't adapt to a lethal virus infection, it may be exterminated. And I'm sure there were examples of bands of 100 or 200 early Homo sapiens that were wiped out by virus infections or reduced to, to two people who could not survive on their own. We just don't have any record of it. Now, many people don't believe in evolution. I get many emails from people who say, I challenge their beliefs, but uh, this is these are the scientific facts that uh, the virus evolution makes it very clear in, in real time how evolution works. If you don't believe that Homo sapiens you know, evolved from ancestral hominids, well, you can just look at SARS-CoV-2 as it evolves to different variants with different properties. That's viral evolution, even if you don't believe in it. And why would you think it's specific for viruses? New viral diseases are always emerging. AIDS, West Nile virus in the U.S., hepatitis C, Ebola virus, and Zika virus diseases, COVID-19. These are new. They come from animals and non-human animals, and they change along the way. That's evolution. Of course, every year we have influenza virus outbreaks caused by evolution of influenza virus and even common cold viruses like common cold coronaviruses. We have drug-resistant HIV and many other viruses. That is all evolution. That is selection of variants in the presence of an antiviral. The simple fact is that evolution happens faster than most people can comprehend and for reasons that are still not clear to me. The press thinks it's a big deal when viruses mutate. I don't get it. I've been puzzled about this for, for years, ages, as long as I've been interacting with the public, which I didn't always do in my career as a virologist. You know, the first part I pretty much hid in my laboratory. So, and we'll come back to this whole issue in a bit. Let's talk about the four main drivers of virus evolution. Four main drivers. Large numbers of progeny. Large numbers of mutants. Quasi-species effects and selection. This is what drives evolution. And we're going to talk about them individually. All right, large numbers of progeny. You should already know from listening in on this course for some time, uh, that uh, viruses make large numbers of progeny. That's one of the ways that they exist because finding a host is pretty random, right? I mean, think about it. Some viruses enter your respiratory droplets and they have to find another host. How random is that? So they make a lot of progeny to make up for it. And here's, uh, here are two examples of this for hepatitis B virus and human immunodeficiency virus. Uh, virus in plasma, the half-life, that's how much, how long it takes for half of the virus to go away. 24 hours for Hep B, six hours for HIV. Daily turnover, 50% and 90%. Total production in the blood, over 10 to the 11th for HBV, 10 to the 9th for HIV. Huge numbers of HIV particles are made daily in a person infected with HIV who is not being treated with uh, antivirals. And that's why resistance is such a problem. And now these viruses, of course, are in a host. So that interface between the virus and our host defense is a great ground for selection and evolution. Obviously, the immune system puts a lot of evolutionary pressure on viruses, and that's just one of many pressures. But it's the one that we can get a good grasp on. We will talk about a bit today the interface between uh, host defense and viruses. As I said, replicating viruses make large numbers of genomes, and in the process, they make large numbers of mutant genomes. Evolution only happens when mutations occur in a population, and you should not look at a mutation as a bad thing. That's why in human genome sequences, we call them SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms polymorphisms, not mutation. Who's to say that your change is a mutant? Maybe it's just another way of being normal. That's why we call them SNPs, and it's a very important, very important uh, nomenclature. So we can only have evolution when you have mutations. I'll show you some experimental evidence for that today. And of course, every time a viral genome reproduces, mutations are produced. 
every reproduction cycle. Viral genomes are always mutating. Now, of course, the headline writers write coronavirus is mutating because they think that protein changes is, is mutation. Or maybe they don't even think about it. Maybe they think it's something that happens now and then. But I want you to understand, and I'm sure you do who are here today, that viral genomes are always mutating. It's not a big deal. As I've said countless times, writing a headline, virus is mutating, is like writing a headline, the earth is round. It is, it is an embarrassment. And don't tell me, give them a break, they don't know the nomenclature, you're just being pedantic. Uh-uh. Doesn't go here in my live stream. And here are some examples. I've collected over the years. This is from the 2015 Ebola virus outbreak in Western Africa. And the first outbreak, viral outbreak, where we really started to do a lot of genome sequencing. The, this is from Time magazine. The Ebola virus is mutating, say scientists. Now, I'm going to, so I'll blame the scientists. This is what Amy would tell me to do. And she's absolutely right here. That the journalists are not making this up in this case because they say, say scientists. So some scientists said, here, scientists at a French research institute said the Ebola virus has mutated and they are studying whether it have become more contagious. Look at that. More, it's always this driving thing. Is it more contagious? Is the only thing you can think about? Is it more contagious? You know, there are a billion other phenotypes that matter. I, I just don't understand this. So some scientists said it's mutated. What they should have said, oh, we found an amino acid change in the glycoprotein. And we're trying to see if that matters. But no, they say it mutated, and then it's like it's a big deal to mutate. Uh, here's another one, of course, from the New York Times last year. The coronavirus is mutating. What does that mean for us? I mean, they, they should just be, they should give back their license for journalism. Of course, they do a lot of other things. But this just pisses me off to no end. This, this is a headline. Uh, you know what? If you talk to the writer of the article, they'll blame the headline writer which is kind of backing out. I understand they don't make the headlines. Well, then fix the headline writers. Damn it, take the virology course and understand that this is not a big deal. Figure out another way to say it. Never going to happen. Nobody cares except you guys. Uh, so here is a, an interesting uh, graph which shows you mutation rates according to genome size. And this is from Principles of Virology, uh, the textbook that I and others have co-authored. On the y-axis, we have mutation rate, and uh, this is substitutions per nucleotide per generation. And on the x-axis, we have the genome size. And so the, the, at the top of the y-axis is the higher mutation rate, right? And at the bottom is the lower mutation rate. Right? So this is like one in one in 100 mutations, and this is one, whatever, 10 to the 10th is. And so here, the, the highest mutation rates are observed in viroids, which we haven't talked about yet in this course, but um, <laughs> we, uh, we, um, we'll talk about it, uh, I think, next week or the week after. We have a, a, a session on this, very interesting uh, entities. Uh, and then we have some RNA viruses here. We have single-stranded RNA viruses, plus polarity and minus. They're all mixed in here. The, the purple are the retroviruses. Uh, then we have our single and we have our double stranded DNA viruses in the open blue circles. And then down here on the right are bacteria. So this is the host DNA mutation frequency, quite low, as you can see. And it's decreasing with increasing genome size. And I, I think that is important because the bigger the genome, uh, the heart, if you have a high mutation frequency, the, the organism will not survive because it will, the likelihood it's going to have lethal mutations is very high. So that's why the coronaviridae are unusual, the, the nidoviralis actually, because they have error correction, and that's why they, their genomes can get so big. And um, the smaller genomes can hi have higher mutation rates. Now, the RNA viruses, of course, do not have error correction, so they live at the edge, and you'll see what I mean by that in, in a minute. But what's interesting here also, just before we leave this, is we have the single-stranded DNA viruses, which have a higher mutation uh, rate than uh, double-stranded DNA viruses, uh, which, in my view, is not understood. It's not just because there's only one strand of DNA. It's, there's something more to it, and people are working on it. I've spoken with plant virologists who study single-stranded 
DNA viruses, and they don't know the, the, the reason. All right, so first now, we have all this diversity. We have extensive mutation. This is codified in 19, what is it, 78 by a paper that was published in Cell. I think one of the most important papers, uh, unfortunately, it didn't make my 10 top seminal papers in molecular biology. I should have, I suppose. Uh, but it, it, uh, it is called Analysis of an RNA Bacteriophage Population Cubeta. And this introduced what has become known as the quasi-species concept. Not a great name, but I understand what it means. And this is a quote from the paper by Esteban Domingo, uh, Sabo Taniguchi, and Charles Weissman. I'm sorry, the title is Nucleotide Sequence Heterogeneity of an RNA Phage Population. So this is 1978. Uh, we're just beginning to be able to sequence viral genomes. And there's some methods that are being used to look at it, not quite sequencing methods, but they're giving a hint at what's there. So before this, we have no idea about how, how diverse viral genomes are. And so what they write is a Q-beta phage population, this is an RNA phage that infects bacteria, is in a dynamic equilibrium with viral mutants arising at a high rate on the one hand and being strongly selected against on the other. The genome cannot be described as a defined unique structure, but rather a weighted average of a large number of different individual sequences. Way ahead of its time. I, I didn't understand what this meant. I was a graduate student in 1978. Um, so not appreciated by most virologists. I would say still not appreciated in, by most viral by many virologists. Uh, and I think uh, most people on the planet have little appreciation. And perhaps you today will be some of those 185 of you that will have a better appreciation. Essentially, what this means is that virus populations are not just one sequence. They exist as uh, non-identical but related replicons called a quasi-species. A replicon is just a replicating genome. It's a nice word for it. And the quasi-species was what Domingo gave it. But even that's not correct because the idea was that a species, like a cow, right, is a species and it's defined by a sequence. But a virus isn't defined by a sequence. But cows are all different also, so it doesn't really work. However, the, the word was used for many years. Now we have a new generation of uh, people who look at genome sequences, right? Andrew Rambeau and Eddie Holmes and Trevor Bedford and their ilk, Jesse Bloom, and they don't like quasi-species for the same reason that I just said it's not really correct. So they're trying to change it to mutant, swarm, or cloud. Okay, so now you have the three terms. I will use quasi-species, even though I'm a pedant. I kind of like it. Although I can see mutant cloud is cool. It smirks of sci-fi, I suppose. Anyway, what, here's, the, here's what a viral quasi-species is. Now, in 1981, I published the genome sequence of poliovirus, one of the first viral genome sequences done in 1981 with David Baltimore. So I was way at the beginning of this stuff, uh, and I've been thinking about it for a long time. So here's the sequence I published. But that's not what the tube of poliovirus looks like. It's more like on the left, where each line is a genome of poliovirus, and each symbol is a different base at a different position. Most of the genomes are different. That's what a quasi-species is. You can grow up poliovirus in a, cells, in a cell culture in the lab, and uh, hand me a tube, and that tube will be full of different sequences. It will not have this one sequence. This one sequence is a consensus because the sequencing method that I used could only make a consensus. It couldn't detect the small differences shown on the left here. And even to this day, it's very hard to find all the different genomes in a tube of any virus. We mostly get a consensus, although there's some ways around that. And so this is a myth that this is poliovirus because that virus actually may not exist in the tube. Maybe it's because it's an average, right? So that's a quasi-species here. Every virus is like that. The, D the RNA viruses, of course, have the most diverse quasi-species, and the DNA viruses have less diverse, but they also have quasi-species. They have lots of mutations, at, just at a lower frequency. So this is what I call the myth of consensus genome sequences for any given RNA virus and probably DNA as well to a lesser extent. The genome sequences cluster around a consensus or an average, but every genome can be different from the other. If there are a million genomes in that tube, they could be all different. And that 
polio sequence that I did may not exist in the population. I have to tell you, when I was doing this sequence in 1980, I had no clue about this. No clue. Um, I learned many years later. And I've had a number of, well, I don't think they are moments, but I've had a number of revelations over the years. And this is in part why I want to share all of this with you so that I can give you my particular understanding of what's going on. All right? The virus is not, and, and you know, people are not individual sequ sequences either. Every person is different and every cell in your body is different. So when we get your genome sequence, it's a consensus. So what happens? What's the implication of this? This is what I call quasi-species effects. So when you inhale a droplet, a respiratory droplet from another person that has their SARS-CoV-2 in it, you're not getting a single virus genome. If you did, you would have one virus particle and that would never work. It would never initiate an infection. It's going to be eliminated by all the physical and chemical and innate defenses immediately. You need more than one. How many you need, we, we know for very few viruses. So the infections are initiated by a population, whether it's 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. They're all different genomes. And then those get into cells and undergo selection. There are selective forces in the host in that respiratory epithelium. They're going to select out of that population the ones that work the best. And then among the ones that initiated the infection, there have some survivors that have reproduced. They're going to go outside and infect the new host. And they're going to be a quasi-species. So it comes in as a quasi-species and it goes out as a quasi-species. And that's how variants emerge, by having such extensive variation randomly and selection occurring to pull out the ones that are more fit. And that's what we're seeing with the variants. And once again, I'm going to say this a billion times, we don't know why they're more fit. Do not by any epidemiologist who tells you it's because they're more transmissible. Epidemiological observations cannot tell you that, only experiments in the laboratory. Now, the quasi-species is further expanded by recombination and reassortment, right? Mutation is not the only way to make different genomes. Remember, recombination occurs among viruses when polymerases uh, copy Two different viral genomes in a single cell can be RNA or DNA-based recombination and reassortment. Uh, viruses with segmented genomes. Uh, if multiple of them infect a single cell, we can have reassortants come out of the infection that have different sets of RNA segments from the two parents. So just to remind you that it's not just mutation, it's recombination and reassortment that contributes to this. All right, so we don't have actually a Socrative today. Uh, because this, this lecture is a remnant of my past frustration with Columbia University students where they, you know, have a class of 120 students and then 10 of them would um, <laughs> answer the quiz online. So what the heck? Why am I wasting my time? And so this lecture has no questions. This session has no questions. But I'm going to take a break here and answer <laughs> your questions. Um, most of the lectures, most of the sessions have questions now because the year Vanity Nutrition took this course, the students revolted and they say, we want questions. It was an online, maybe that's why, right? Online is different. When the students are in class, they do other things. They read the paper online. They play games online. I can tell they're laughing. Once, one year I sat in the back of the classroom and I had a guest lecturer in my virology course. I can't tell you how many people were watching the damned World Cup during the lecture. I mean, seriously? No respect? <laughs> All right. Um, let's go up for some questions here. No, there's no... I'm sorry. There's no uh, Socrative. Mm, let's see how many... Okay, let's start with this one, which is really... Um, not related, but why did I think unmasking Im immunity was uh, an eye-opener? Because, I'll do this briefly. Everyone's talking about neutralizing antibodies with respect to protection against infection with SARS-CoV-2, right? We see Omicron, and we do neutralization assays, and the neutralization drops. And everyone freaks out. And that paper showed me there's way more to antibodies than neutralization. There are all kinds of other functions that are not 
captured by neutralization assays. And for RS virus, it matters. They, there are some cases where there are no non-neutralizing antibodies, yet the monkeys were still protected because they have antibodies that do other things. That's why it was an eye-opener for me because I never thought the extent of it went be, way beyond. I knew there were some non-neutralizing antibodies, but the extent of that is really remarkable. And so I just think we need to stop focusing on neutralization assays. You know why we do? Because they're easy to do. Uh, the paper we did yesterday on TWIB, they did neutralization assays in a week on uh, Omicron. Easy to do. The other assays are hard. So this is a thing, you know, in the world. People tend to take the easy way out. And I'm sure I am guilty of that as well. I don't mean to be critical. Okay, let's um, get back here. Yeah, Socrates, I'm sorry. I should have told you at the beginning. I forgot. <laughs> That's, there's no quiz today. There might be um, Monday. I just don't remember. Yes, yeah, so, so Marge716 says, thanks for not hiding in the lab. I decided many years ago to start to put my focus on communication, okay? It's not what I'm supposed to do as a research virologist. It's not, let me tell you again, it's not what I'm supposed to do. Um, I'm supposed to stay in the lab, write grants and papers, and get a lot of people to do experiments. But I thought this would be more powerful. So this has been my experiment. I think it works. But my other career has certainly not flourished as a consequence. I'm not, I'm not sad about that in any way. It's just the way it is. It's the decision I made. But I do not have a high-powered laboratory as a consequence of doing this. But I think it's, it's important. And, you know, I don't care if there are 20 people here. It's, it's, if there were zero, then I wouldn't do it, obviously. Are th the number of changes... Oh, I, I was going to put a timer up here because... Uh, how do I start the timer? Wait, oh, yeah, there you go. Because otherwise I'll be answering questions forever. <laughs> I forgot to start the timer. Um, are the number of changes unlimited or does evolution eventually reach the plateau? Uh, so we're going to actually address that it, towards the end of this lecture, uh, of this session. I guess I should just call them lectures because I can't stop saying it. Um, uh, viruses will keep changing as long as they're reproducing in hosts. There's the, the idea that there's some endpoint is absurd. There's no end point to evolution. In fact, evolution doesn't make a better machine. That's not the point of evolution. Evolution adapts the machine to the current situation. So the idea that there's this trajectory and we're getting better and better is wrong. And that's because we look at us and see, whoa, look at our eyes and our respiratory tracts. We evolved from single cells to this. So that's better, right? And yeah, but there are plenty of organisms that are still single cells and they've been really successful. Okay, so it's not a trajectory. All right, so there are questions about transmissibility of COVID. We're going to talk about that. You could ask them again then. I don't think this is the right place here, even though I did mention it. I'm sorry. Uh, it seems hard indeed to call something a mutant if the norm is I am different from you. I agree. Now, the problem is in the lab we make mutations. And that's the way the thing was defined years ago, right? A change in nucleic acid sequence. But the word mutation has, has acquired a bad connotation. It's just a change. But, you know... Um, movies use sci-fi sci movies use mutant to say this is something weird or different right so it's got a bad rap and so we use snips as a consequence Now, this is a very philosoph philosophical, very, viruses prove life on Earth is meaningless. Bits of nucleic uh, replicating just because they can. I don't, I, so, so Lex Friedman asked me, what's the meaning of life? I said, there is no meaning. It's a random event. And we happen to be an interesting species because we can, we have sentience, we can think, and we can <laughs> do amazing things, right? Like live streaming. Mm -hmm. Ants can't do that. But ants do amazing things too, in their own way. 
And every organism is amazing in its own way. So this evolution, even though it's random, is pretty cool. So I wouldn't say it's meaningless because I just look at it and I'm blown away, right? Anyway, I got the woman's permission to take a picture of the tattoo. So I don't know why you're complaining about what I did. The fact it's not an identifying feature because I've seen a lot of other people with the same tattoo. Assuming SARS-CoV-2 becomes seasonal, is it possible if seasonal at the same time as other viruses, its evolution will be shaped by other? It could be, yes. If you have co-infections, that's definitely going to shape the outcome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Priscilla's a journalist. I don't mean to insult all journalists. I just wish you would... And, and I'm not talking to you, Priscilla. You, you, you understood the problem that I said it. Mutate, the virus is mutating is not a headline. And please understand why it's not. Uh, evolution is an incredibly tricky subject, constantly going through refinements and revisions. Yes, it is a tricky subject, and we're understanding it more and more. But I, as you'll see today, we have some concrete ideas, right? A large genome imply, almost implies there must be some error correction. Um, the early talk about SARS-CoV-2 having, I don't know what, the spell check got you there, Brian, with dinner. <laughs> yes, and that's why we think the needle virales genomes can get big because of error correction, yeah. So viruses do not mutate by themselves. Their reproduction is controlled by the host cells. No, that's not correct. Um, for all viruses, anyway. RNA viruses, there's no protein in the cell that copies the genome of RNA viruses, okay? They're all virus encoded, and those don't have error correction. <laughs> there are some viruses, DNA viruses, that encode their own polymerase, right? But they have error correction machinery. But even with an error correction machinery, they still make mistakes. And then there's some viruses that are copied by host DNA polymerase. Those DNA polymerases have error correction. But they also make mistakes because our genome mutates at a certain frequency. So there's a double-stranded DNA viruses that utilize host DNA replication systems, mutate at the similar frequency as the host. So your statement is too broad, okay? You can't make these overarching statements. Why isn't it so obvious why single-stranded DNA? Well, so go ask a person who works on them, and they won't tell you because there's just one strand, all right? It's more than that. So, I mean, never mind. A weighted average of a genome. Uh, I. The point is that when you do a consensus, you have a, a method that will not show you a difference, say, if there's less than 15% of the population difference at a particular position. So that gives you the consensus. Why not just say a variant is becoming more common? Well, it is getting more fit than the previous variants, although you don't know how, say, if you go alpha, then delta, then omicron, so Delta replaces Alpha and Omicron replaces Delta, but would Omicron replace Alpha? So it's not necessarily a, a continuum, right? Anyway, I think fitness is the precise way, but most people don't get it. Yeah, common may be better for the lay person. I wouldn't have a problem with that, but um, they want to use the T word because the epidemiologists used it. Yesterday, you know, there was a big outbreak of uh, SARS-CoV-2 at Cornell University in Ithaca. And the president this morning says, it's, uh, Omicron is so much more transmissible. We have to be careful. This is BS, president of Cornell. That's because the WHO says it's more transmissible. That's the word they use. Yes, I'm sorry about the dog. I'm home uh, because I had a doctor's appointment this morning, and I wasn't able to get into New York in time. So I'm at home, and you'll hear dogs. You will hear. This is very embarrassing. My wife hired people to, to blow the leaves off the lawn because I don't have time to do it, and they're, they're making noise too. Sorry. 
Uh, two minutes and 30 seconds. V needle virus also makes errors uh, making, for example, subgenomic. This also means the proteins are also different in the population uh, than... The, yes, that's correct. The, the mRNAs can be different as well, and those wouldn't be heritable, right? Yep. Is it possible for a less virulent variant to become more virulent? A anything is possible until you show it, though, and we'll talk a little bit about the evolution of virulence uh, today. Darwin's evolution works on a living organism. Well, that's what he looked at. But the evolution is at the level of proteins and genes. That's why I put a protein on that slide. It, it's actually the fundamental lowest level is at the level of the gene. Isn't genetic drift also occurring in SARS-CoV-2 in far-flung corners during times of low infection? Yes, yes. Why, why would you conclude that fitness is not selected because of that? Of course it's selected when you have huge numbers of people that are infected. You select for a more fit variant. That's what we're seeing. Earlier questions disappeared from the website. Yeah, I took them down because you're supposed to do them in a week. And I actually left them up for many more weeks than that. But in my course, they're up for a week. And if, if you don't do it, um, I'm sorry because... Um, I, I do want you to follow the course guidelines, and I know that you all have jobs and so forth, but it's okay. And you're going to get a final exam, by the way, all right? So, <laughs> so every virion probably has at least one nucleotide base change deletion or addition during a cycle. Yeah, every virion. So a 10,000 base genome, if the error rate is 1 in 10,000, every time it's copied, there's one change. It's amazing, right? It's really amazing. And I and I'm a daily turnover number for SARS-CoV-2. I'm not aware of it. It may be known. That's a great question. But you know, it's tough to do because the the viruses I showed you, HBV and HIV, you can just take blood and measure it. And there's no there's you know the, there's some maybe some SARS-CoV-2 in blood, but it's not an essential phase. So it wouldn't be representative of what's going on in the respiratory tract, which is much more difficult to sample quantitatively. Right? You take a swab. How do you know how much you have there? Yeah. Does every cell division in humans also create mutant? Yeah, of course. Every cell division. That's why every cell in you is different from every other. Every single, look at my face, it's made up of billions of cells. Every one of them has a slightly different genome sequence from the other. No question about it. Many of you are thanking me for doing this, I, and I appreciate it. I don't do it so that you will thank me. You realize that. I do it because I love it and I, I love seeing people learn. I got that in the class at Columbia for many years and I love it online. When, I, when people learn something, there's that eureka moment. Oh, I get that. That to me is the best thing that I can do. So I don't, resent, I don't regret not being a uh, high-powered uh, research scientist. And thank you, Renzo, for pointing that out. Renzo and I communicate on Instagram a lot. And, and yes, the point of doing this live stream is that I could answer your questions. It's not me just talking, which is mostly what I do in class, because in class, the students don't ask many questions. I don't know why they're scared. But, you know, we have 75 minutes, so it's very tight. And here, um, there's no time limit, although I, I do like to keep it to two hours because I, I have you know respect for everyone's time and the moderators and so forth. So um, let's do uh, one more here, and then we'll... Move on. Um, is there a theoretical upper limit on the possible size of a genome? So that's a great question. For many years, it was thought to be about 30,000, for RNA viruses, it was thought to be about 30,000 bases. And the, and for DNA viruses, it wasn't very big. But then we discovered giant virus genomes, and what is it, two and a half million base pairs now that could be. It's probably 
I don't know what the theoretical upper limit is. It depends on the capsid, right? The capsid has to encase the genome. And for the RNA viruses, it was thought to be about 30,000. And then uh, viruses were found that um, are much bigger in the coronaviridae, in the nidovirales. So th I think the upper limit now has been calculated to be about one to 200,000 bases for RNA alone. But... Um, um, yeah, that's it. That's what I think. Uh, and John says he recommends uh, the Tangled Tree is very good. Uh, John, you probably don't know this, but we interviewed David on Twivo uh, a number of years ago. Nels and I interviewed him about the Tangled Tree. He's been on Twiv many times as well. It's a great book. I like David Quammen. David Quammen is one of the science writers who gets it, and if you tell him this is not the right way to do it, he gets it, okay? And I respect that. Instead of making up, like Carl Zimmer makes up his own stuff, he says this and that. And, and I'm telling you, it just, yes, yeah, someone said here, it drives Vincent crazy, and it does, and maybe some people don't care, but it does drive me crazy. Okay, so um, when you infect cells so with a quasi-species, we have selection occurring. And we'll talk about some examples of selection. And so sometimes a rare genome with a particular change will survive, and that mutation will be found in all progeny genomes, survival of the fittest. Sometimes you have survival of the survivors. Sometimes there are other mutations that are linked but neutral, say. They go along. They're not going to be gone because it doesn't matter, although they may eventually just randomly. And so after you infect the host with a quasi-species, what happens when it comes out is different. Although our experimental methods um, make it difficult to, to examine exactly how different it is, there are different, there may be mutations that have selected. And some of the great examples of work done in this is when a mosquito infects a uh, vertebrate host. And so there's often a change in the quasi-species from mosquito to the host. And then when the mosquito takes a blood meal later, the quasi-species changes again. Now, this whole idea of mutation, which we call diversity, it's selected. It is itself evolutionarily selected, right? That's kind of a thing, hard thing to get your head around. Mutation is selected for. Mutations in polymerases uh, have been identified that reduce the frequency of incorporation errors. And one of them is the poliovirus RNA polymerase here, where a single amino acid change, this is the RNA polymerase of poliovirus, that's the active site. We learned this a long time ago. That's why I teach you basic molecular biology in this course, because you could not look at this and understand what I'm telling you if you hadn't taken that RNA synthesis lecture. And I know you didn't like it as much as these lectures, but it's essential. If you want to understand something, you have to get in the weeds, you have to have a little pain. Anyway, this is a single amino acid change that makes the poliovirus RNA polymerase make fewer errors. And there are similar examples in polymerases of E. coli. So it's not just a poliovirus thing. These polymerases that make fewer errors do not have a selective advantage when you propagate them to together with wild-type virus. So we call them anti-mutators. If you take a poliovirus with this change and mix it with wild-type polio and put them together in cells, who do you think wins? The wild-type. Why? Because the anti-mutator cannot make enough mutations to be competitive. So low mutations rates are neither advantageous nor selected in nature. The mutants that we make, like this polio mutant, are often less pathogenic. So we conclude that high mutation rates are, in fact, selected during virus evolution. Mutation is good for viral populations. Another reason not to make the viruses mutating headlines, because it's it's good for viruses. may not be good for us, but it is good for them. Now, we have to introduce a concept called the error threshold. And I think you get this, right? I've just told you mutation is good, but you can't have too much of it, right? I mean, red wine is great, but you can't have too much of it. Same thing with mutation. You have to have a balance between genetic fidelity and the mutation rate. What do I mean by that? You have to make an organism that works and it has to be fit. And that limit is called the error threshold. If you go above the error threshold, it's simply the number of mutations per genome. You lose infectivity and that's it, you're gone. 
And if you exist too far below the error threshold, you cannot make enough mutations to, to survive selection. Okay, that's a, a very important concept. RNA viruses evolve close to the error threshold. DNA viruses are far below it. RNA viruses live on the edge. That's why I love them. They live on the edge as defined by this error threshold. Okay, let's, let's explore this a bit. I'll show you some evidence, actually. Here's some experiment with a DNA virus. We have a cell culture infected with a DNA virus, and we add to the culture a base analog called 5-Aza-Cytidine. And it's a, it's a modified form of cytidine. Uh, and that's cytidine right there. And uh, you can see that it's pro this is actually azocytidine. It has a, extra nitrogens in the ring. Uh, it's incorporated as a C, but it templates as a T. So when aza C is in the genome, when it's put there, and then later when it's copied again, it doesn't look like a C to the polymerase. It looks like a T, so you get G to A mutations or transitions. Essentially, what you can do is, is increase the mutation rate of the genome by adding this to the culture by several orders of magnitude. And, and in fact, it doesn't affect virus reproduction. So you can increase the mutation rate of this DNA virus by several orders of magnitude, 10, 100, maybe 1,000 fold, and it doesn't affect virus reproduction. But when you do a similar experiment with an RNA virus, the best you can do is increase the error frequency per genome two or three fold because beyond that, the virus loses infectivity. That's what I mean by RNA viruses living at the edge, living just below the error threshold. So here's the experiment with an RNA virus, poliovirus. The, the mutagen here is ribavirin. Uh, ribo, the way vi one of the ways ribavirin works, it's a base analog. It's incorporated by the polymerase, and it causes mutations to occur in the genome. So here we have an experiment where we're looking at uh, the specific infectivity of the genome versus mutations introduced by treatment with ribavirin. So what you do is you treat with increasing concentrations of ribavirin, and then you infect cells, and you take what comes out, a virus that comes out, and you sequence the genomes, and you see how many mutations there are in them. So you see when you have no ribavirin or very little, th th there are no, there's, uh, here, here the, no ribavirin, of course, there are no mutations. You have 100% infectivity. And if you have one mutation, <clears throat> really no effect. But you hear two mutations. You've already plummeted below 40% infectivity. And seven mutations is almost nil. So this is the evidence that <laughs> RNA viruses e exist just below the error threshold. And, th and that's uh, probably one of the ways that drug works, pushing viruses over the error threshold. Now, another uh, important aspect, which illustrates the importance of a quasi-species, is a genetic bottleneck. And let me explain what these are. Extreme selective pressures on small populations that result in a loss of diversity. You accumulate mutations and you lose infectivity. So here's the experiment. You, you do a plaque assay with an RNA virus and you pick a single plaque, right? There's agar over this. And so you can uh, take a pipette, plunge it into the agar, you get the virus, and then you take that single plaque and do another plaque assay on it. You, you don't grow up the virus from the plaque. You simply uh, mix it in with, with a buffer and then you do another plaque assay. You pick another plaque and you do it. And you keep doing that. So plaque, this is called plaque to plaque passage. And what you find is after 20 or 30 of these single plaque amplifications or plaque to plaque passages, you, get, you end up with a virus that can barely grow because they're markedly less fit. Fitness, this is all about fitness. That's how we quantify virus growth in a population. So what happened? It's the same environment, right? It's the same HeLa cell, it's the same media, even could be the same person doing the plaque assay. What's the selection pressure? Why do we lose fitness? Well, there's an answer. And the answer is the bottleneck because what you're doing is restricting uh, viruses 
to whatever is in that single plaque, maybe 10,000 or a few thousand viruses in a single plaque. So that is causing the loss of fitness. You know, you take a bottleneck, right? You have a parent population of viruses and, you know, there's a thin neck, so you can only get a, a certain number of viruses through it. It's a reduced uh, it's a reduced fraction of the whole population. And so you, you can grow this up and keep doing this over and over. And this is sort of like having a plaque-to-plaque -plaque passage. You are restricting diversity to the few thousand viruses found uh, in a single plaque. And so this actually is a process that was described many years ago by a geneticist, who, Muller. He called it Muller's Ratchet. And he was studying asexual populations, not viruses, but there are plenty of asexual uh, cellular populations out there uh, that accumulate deleterious mutations. And it's the same thing. Asexual division doesn't allow for diversity in the genome. And RNA viruses are, are in a similar position. They exist close to the error threshold. That's the first part of it. And if you restrict the passage to these founders in a single plaque, even though you're not applying any selection, the number of mutations, of course, accumulate with each reproduction, but there's not enough population diversity to rescue those mutations. That's why fitness decreases. So if you had a large virus population, then you'd have plenty of mutations to rescue any deleterious ones that might be present. But here you're restricting the passage to very few viruses, and that's the problem. It's the restriction of the virus to a small number. And, and that's the ratchet metaphor describes this very nicely. You know what a ratchet is, right? It's a, it's a wheel that can only go in one direction. Each of the new mutations works like a ratchet. It allows the gear to move forward, but not backward. Every round of error-prone replication works like a ratchet. Clicks every time there's a new mutation accumulating. You can't go back. So what does go back meaning in the term, in the idea of a ratchet? That means having a big population so that if you have a mutant genome here that can't work, there's another one in the quasi-species that will work. So that'll work. That'll replicate. You don't have that advantage here. You've reduced the diversity of the quasi-species. So that's why this bottleneck occurs, because you're interfering with the quasi-species, which you can also interfere with by making polymerases that are anti-mutator, that make less mutations, or you can do this experimental alteration by doing the plaque-to-plaque -plaque fitness. So here you can look at it, the initial population. You know, if you grow the whole population in cells and culture, you will have so many mutations to sample that you won't have a fitness effect in culture. But if you pick a plaque, so now we pick a plaque which is derived from, say, this one virus here with two stars and a triangle, now the diversity is very restricted. You can see because all these genomes have those two. They have other mutations that have arisen as a result of error-prone replication, but they do not have the diversity of the quasi-species. You've bottlenecked the populations. You accumulate mutations. All these other changes accumulate, and you lose fitness because you can't rescue them. You cannot rescue them by the population diversity. It's an example of why the quasi-species is important. And so here are some experimental examples of fitness decline after passage through this bottleneck by plaque-to-plaque -plaque passage. Uh, here's a bacteriophage. These are the number of passages, plaque-to-plaque, -plaque, and the decrease in fitness, VSV, foot and mouth disease virus, HIV, another bacteriophage. You can see, particularly uh, good for... for uh, <laughs> Uh, good, not good for the virus, but a big decline in fitness. So these are all the same mechanism. You're restricting the quasi-species and, and fitness declines as a consequence. Now, are there such things in the real world? Uh, are there infections initiated by limited numbers of viruses uh, and um, subsequent limited numbers? Well, um, there are certainly infections initiated by limited numbers of viruses like Aerosol transmission, right, or droplet transmission. Uh, well, some viruses are transmitted in the very small droplets, the aerosols, and measles virus is one of them. And uh, there are not a lot of viruses there. So that could technically impose a bottleneck. But as soon as that virus gets into the host, it amplifies. So any restriction is gone. You know, activation of a latent virus from 
ganglia, right? Peripheral ganglia in a herpes virus. Not a lot of cells are making virus or a small volume of inoculum by insect bites. So how do they escape Muller's ratchet? Well, the obvious answer is that they infect and the population expands. So there's no more bottleneck after that first passage. But there are also other ways to do it. Um, so here, for example, if you pool plaques and passage them this way, you're not going to get a ratchet effect. You're not going to have a bottleneck because there's a lot of population diversity. And again here, more diversity in the population facilitates construction of a mutation-free genome by recombination or reassortment. So that's another way. Besides expanding the population, which happens after a mosquito bite, for example, uh, you can um, uh, restore the the errors by um, recombination or reassortment. What do I mean by that? So here we have two uh, mutant genomes. The mutation is shown by the uh, lightning bolt there in purple. And they could recombine in the infected cell and make an infectious uh, recombinant. And same thing could happen for reassortment. So there are these are some of the ways that the ratchet is avoided, but you need to have enough progeny in order to do that. Now, a really interesting uh, expansion of this idea comes from, again, poliovirus RNA polymerase. Remember this G64S single amino acid change reduces the error frequency of the polymerase and it makes it um, um, markedly less fit. This amino acid change over here on the other side of the molecule is actually recombination defective. And if you do the ribavirin experiment with, with this uh, L42A, it exacerbates this uh, ribavirin-induced error catastrophe. It gets even worse. You have a, a more rapid decline with even fewer mutations per genome. So this tells us, it shows us experimentally, you need recombination to counter this error catastrophe in this particular experiment. So, you know, interfering with recombination in the, in the poliovirus genome makes it even harder to uh, counter error catastrophe. So this is a very straightforward message, I think. Diversity is important for the survival of individual members of the population. It's the whole population that contributes to survival of individual members. If you remove diversity, the population suffers. You can remove it by making anti-mutator polymerases or by bottlenecks, as I've shown you, and there's certainly other ways to do it as well. Okay, let's do some, uh, some more questions. Let's turn the timer on here. And let's see, we went... <laughs> Barb, you got infected by my... Um, you got infected by my fitness transmission issue, and I'm sure some of you have been. Many of you object to what I'm saying, but that's fine. Um, does the rate of evolution of a viral species tend to increase as the number of hosts increase? All right, so it depends what you're talking about by evolution, right? The mutation rate does not change. The mutation rate, the error rate of the polymerase is an intrinsic property. But phenotypic changes, selection of mutations, can change, yes, in different hosts. So the rate of arising of certain amino acids can be very quick if the virus has encountered a new series of hosts. Uh, but remember, and we'll talk about this more next time, a stable virus-host relationship, there's less opportunity for selection of changes, yes. Can we tell how, if, how, when a certain virus originally, for example, how old? Yes, we're going to talk about that today. Yep. RNA viruses are not copied by the host cell. They're copied by their own polymerase. I just said that. What, are you watching the World Cup? Just kidding. For a non-scientist, wrapping your brain around continuous mutation is just as hard as wrapping your brain around quantum mechanics. Never, Nothing is ever static. Maybe I find quantum tough, but, um, I mean, it just, mutation happens all the time. That's it. 
consequences may be hard to understand. Can you be infected by multiple variants? Sure. It's just a matter of encountering them. Of course, some of them, if, if Delta predominates, there's nothing around. And now you have both Delta and Omicron. So it's, po it's possible until uh, Delta is gone. So WHO uses the term incorrectly. So that's my contention is that they're not using it in the virological sense. They're talking about movement of a virus. What is the word that someone used? I can't even remember. Through a population. So they're using that as transmission. But mine is, see, transmission is a property of human behavior and the virus. And they can't figure out what the virus is contributing. And I want to know it because it contributes. You can you can reduce the R0 to below 1 and that that stops the outbreak, right? But you're not changing the intrinsic transmissibility of the virus. I think that's the best way to explain that. I'm glad that some of you have um, – there's no such thing as a random point mutation. All right. Well, that's fine. You can believe that. Uh, I have been studying mutations for years. If certainly, they're randomly inserted by the polymerase. If you know what controls your insertion, I would love to know, but we don't know if that's the case. <laughs> Thank you, Squoyster, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. All right, so WHO doesn't seem to attract the brightest minds. So I wouldn't say they're brightest, not the brightest, but they have a different way of thinking. They're, they view public health and epidemiology. They're not basic scientists for the most part. So they don't think the way that I do. And my point is you need to be, you need to consider the basic science before you say things. Everyone in the U.S. needs to have this understanding of adaptation and fitness versus transmission. The problem with this country and the world is that we don't understand science. Amen, Dr. Balananda. I don't know how to do it. I'm doing my best, right? I'm doing my best. Are we now into COVID-19-3 rather than a new variant? Well, SARS-CoV-2 would be a strain, right? So we have to see. We have to do lab experiments to see if... What are the properties of this virus that make it different? RNA reproduction of the virus, not the cell, has no error correction. That's correct. Thank you, uh, Rob, for your, for your contribution. DNA is here to stay, but I would say RNA is also here to stay, right? Right. Is Vibovirin tested? I think so. I think it was tested a long time ago, but I don't recall the outcome. You can you can easily look it up, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Could we make artificial variants of viruses that are less pathogenic but more fit? Uh, if we knew <laughs> if we knew what could control that, yes. So <clears throat> the polio infectious vaccine strains are less pathogenic. I wouldn't say they're more fit. They're as fit or they're, they're probably less fit than the wild virus. And what happens with those, as we talked about in the vaccine lecture, is that as they reproduce in your gut after you ingest them orally, the genome changes and then you make viruses that are more fit and they are shed and they spread through the population. So it's hard to make it genetically stable. But in theory, yes, you could do that, but we really don't know how to do that at all. Genetic bottlenecks and reduced fitness is why as animal breeders, we continuously bring in new blood. Yeah, bring in new genes, right? Hyb hybrid vigor, you guys call it. Uh, deliberate genetic bottleneck to create attenuated virus. You could, um, and in fact, that's how many attenuated viruses are made, by passage in cells. So I think that's part of it. But you have to make sure it's fit because it has to do well in the host, right? It can't, if it's wimpy, it's not going to induce a good immune response. So it's a very fine uh, line there. You have to, uh, you have to um, 
tread. The light just went off. Okay, I'm glad it did. <laughs> That's my goal, is to have the light go off. Could viral reservoirs in long-lived cells like HIV and hematopoietic stem cells help avoid the ratchet because those longer-lived cells could have older, older genomes before the bottleneck? I think that's not a bad idea. However, um, you could also imagine that once it's reactivated from a provirus, then you get diversification by reproduction in different cells. So that could rescue it as well, right? Um, are there meds for HIV that freeze its mutations, therefore reducing fitness? No, none of the approved meds do that. No, um, no, that it's it, in theory you could do that, but we don't have any that do that. Is replicative fitness related to which virus instance gets attached to a host cell and pulled in? In part, but every step of the virus cycle. Please understand this every step of the virus cycle, because they all engage host factors. Every step is subject to fitness selection, not just the receptor, but that's what everyone thinks of because, uh, yeah, you have to bind a receptor and get in, and it's the first event, but there can be subsequent events as well. Uh, outrageously stupid idea, but can't we create therapeutic viruses? Uh, so it's not outrageously stupid. We can make therapeutic viruses to cure various diseases in the last session of this course we'll talk about that but you would like to release them and so i would say our understanding of what it takes to do this is so rudimentary that we couldn't think of releasing them perhaps at some point in the future but not now no is it ter correct to think that differences inside a plaque are less than the differences between So in a plaque-to-plaque -plaque passage, uh, I don't know why you would think that because you're having the same amount of amplification, so I would think not. Instead of using a single plaque, we make passages with a small amount of the supernatant. Is this bottleneck different? Yeah, if you had, say, 10,000 virus particles, you could do the same thing, yeah. You could do the same thing. So an unknown number of non-infectious quasi-species debris might be what shows up in the CT of RT-PCR for COVID-19 for both vaccinated and unvaccinated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here you go. The light bulb went on. That's why these RT-PCR tests are not terribly informative, compar especially comparing uh, vaccinated and unvaccinated infected people and doing a single time point. Maybe if you had multiple time points, it would be better. And yes, we're going to talk about uh, viruses as therapeutics in the last session of this course, for sure. Has Omicron uh, modified your opinion on boosters? Well, as I said last week on TWIV, I think the paper we did from Canada demonstrates to me that a third dose corrects the incorrect spacing of the first two doses and now gives you a more broad antibody response, which was lacking in the first two. And that's the data that I wanted. We don't have the disease data, but we have the neutralizing antibody. That's what I wanted. So yes, it does. But I wanted, there were no such data before. And so, um, uh, how many amino acid changes are there with this variant? Where they? So there are a lot of changes in spike, over 30, but then there are, uh, they're in the RBD, they're in the N-terminal domain of spike. There are also changes in uh, the, f the 1A and 1B, nucleoprotein and a few other proteins, but most of them are in the spike. And the last, uh, one of the papers recently, the last preprint we talked about on TWIF, which is going to publish tomorrow, uh, that has a nice diagram of all the changes. Could transmission be one measure of fitness, but one that is easier to measure? So fitness can be, we're going to talk about this in a slide, but fitness can be a consequence of changes in many functions, including transmission, but not necessarily only transmission. So I don't think we should use transmission. We need a better word. I use fitness, but not enough people understand it. So we do need something better. 
when will evolution stop? So when, when genomes stop replicating, both viral and host, then it stops. As long as their genomes replicating, it keeps going. So the original wild type is already mutating. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> what is wild type? Yeah, it's whatever you define it, right? Um, because obviously your wild type is going to be different from mine. Good point. So with proper timing of dose one and two, maybe the third would not be needed. Yes, I think so. The problem is violins that the, the vaccines have been licensed based on a, you know, short interval and they, they're not going to be relicensed because you'd have to do the trials over again and that's not happening. So I think we're stuck with three doses. Is there a species in the world with ceased evolution? No, not that we know of. Not that we know of. Of course, maybe we have less evolution than others, but no, I, I don't think that we, we know that at all. I doubt it, right? Okay, our timer's up. Cool. That works. Go back to slides. All right, and I will give you some examples of selection. And the easiest ones are immune-based because it's easy to measure. So selection of mutants resistant to antibodies or cytotoxic T cells. We can do that in the lab. And you have, say, an individual making antibodies and T cells make a lot of viruses. Among those viruses, there's going to be one that's resistant to antibodies or T cells. And if that is fit, it will spread to another host. And this is what happens with influenza virus all the time. And we call this drift or shift. Drift is copying errors in, in, in immune selection. Every time the genome replicates, if you make an amino acid change in the epitope that the antibody recognizes, then you can have reduced recognition. Or you can have shift, which is a major change in the uh, spike of influenza virus. It, it usually happens after reassortment. So influenza viruses, just to remind you, we classify them by antigenic composition, by serologic testing of the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, those two spikes in the virus particle. And we designate them as HXNY, like H1N1 and H3N2. So there are 18 different hemagglutinins and 11 neuraminidases that we've discovered so far. Uh, the 17 of the hemagglutinin-bearing viruses can infect birds. The 18th is a bat influenza virus, and only H1, H2, and H3 hemagglutinins can infect and transmit between people. So right now we have H1N1 and H3N2 viruses circulating, no H2N2s. So antigenic drift, we've talked about before, are single amino acid changes in any of the epitopes to which antibodies bind and neutralize infectivity. So here's the hemagglutinin protein, and in color here are the different epitopes, which means these are where antibodies bind. And one amino acid change, which arises randomly in the infected host, could allow that virus to now not be neutralized as well. It will consequently be fitter than the ancestral virus, and it may spread through the population. SARS-CoV-2, of course, is undergoing antigenic drift. Uh, we didn't know this was going to happen because previously we didn't have much evidence for antigenic drift in coronaviruses, at least those that infect humans. Uh, but here's the spike protein, of course, of SARS-CoV-2. There it is in its three-dimensional structure. And here is ACE2 in red binding to the uh, receptor binding domain. And as you know, we've be these changes, amino acid changes, N501Y, K417N, E484K, uh, these are uh, famous amino acid changes present in multiple variants that have arisen and apparently been selected for. Why they confer a fitness advantage, it may be that they can evade antibodies, but it may also be other reasons that we haven't sorted out yet. And I think it's too early to say definitively that this selection is, is immune-based. And you can look at these uh, sequences by variant over time. This is a lovely uh, page in Our World in Data where they're looking at analyzed sequences in the preceding two weeks in each country that corresponds to each variant. So you can see South Africa for the past two weeks, 100% of all the sequences have been Omicron in red. Uh, and Omicron is penetrating through other countries as well. As you can see here, it tells me this is 
a very fit virus, and it will probably displace Delta, which was the previous fit virus in, in many countries, as you can see by this colored uh, bar here. But again, why these variants are more fit, we don't know. Obviously, the antibody changes are making a difference. There, there are some changes in the receptor binding interface that could affect affinity, but I think we need to do the experiments to find out what those changes mean. Now, a similar thing happens for influenza virus and SARS-CoV-2. I've shown you this before, I think, but it's worth repeating. Uh, this on the top is, is global variant tracking of SARS-CoV-2. And again, the percent of that particular variant with time from January 2020 to March 2021. And you can see how some variants initially uh, predominate and others displace it, right? Same thing happens with influenza virus, H3N2, H1N1, the B virus. You have continuous replacement, emergence of new lineages and replacement. And we think these uh, variants arise because they are antigenically uh, able to evade antibody because there are changes in the epitopes. We don't know if that's the case for SARS-CoV-2. Those experiments need to be done. I mean, there's certainly uh, less neutralization in the variants, but you know why this is making them more fit is not known. And don't let someone tell you it's known. It's not. It's got to be sorted out. But I, I've said this before. Let me say it once again. No one in the flu field ever calls these variants more transmissible. I don't know why there's a difference. They are more fit because they evade the antibodies. No evidence for increased, I'm talking about increased intrinsic transmissibility of the virus, and it's the same for SARS-CoV-2. It uh, can also have reassortment giving rise to new variants, and the influenza viruses exemplify this. Uh, here are uh, three recent pandemics. Well, I don't know if 1918 is recent, but 1918, 1957, 1968. The 1918 uh, pandemic caused... You know, we, we have the genome sequence, and each of the segments seem to have been derived from an avian influenza virus. The reservoir of influenza virus is largely in, in birds, particularly aquatic birds. Uh, and then that virus, uh, after the pandemic, circulated in humans f until 1957, causing yearly outbreaks, but not pandemics. In 1957, the, the H2N2 virus caused the pandemic, and it had... Uh, an HA, a neuraminidase gene segment, and a PB1 segment from a different uh, influenza virus from birds. And so the HA and the NA, of course, no human was immune to either of those or had any immunity to those uh, spikes. And so that's why this virus caused a pandemic. It somehow got made its way from uh, birds. It reassorted somewhere. And we have the red segments from the uh, H1N1. So those are from human influenza viruses. But these yellow ones came from an avian influenza virus. And, you know, it depends on contact between the birds and people somewhere. And in 1968, another uh, pandemic virus emerged, H3N2. Um, you have uh, a number of segments from the original H1N1. You have uh, the one yellow segment from 1957, and then two new ones, including the HA from a different avian influenza virus. And so again, nobody has immunity to this new HA, the H3. And so we have a pandemic. In 2009, the most recent influenza virus pandemic, uh, that virus is the product of reassortment of influenza viruses from um, pigs, humans, and birds. And so you can see the colors of each segment showing its origin in influenza viruses that infect Eurasian swine. There's a big swine industry in the world, and many countries ship swine back and forth. Uh, the, the classic swine, H1N1, actually arose in 1918. This virus also went into pigs at the same time, so that's a consequence of that. These still circulate in pigs. Human H3N2, avian virus, which made some intermediate reassortance, and finally the, the last one. So... This is just amazing. And, you know, the, the increasing number of pigs and birds that we raise for food increases the likelihood that this is going to happen. All right, so now uh, let's turn to what I... Let's go back to Alice in Wonderland. Around here, it takes all the running you can do just to stay in the same place. Our ability to sequence genomes of both viruses and hosts now allows us to look at the back and forth between viruses and hosts. And these are called 
post-virus arms races, or Red Queen conflicts. So, why Red Queen? Well, because Alice uh, and and, uh, and, the, and the Queen, you know, around here, takes all the running you can do to just stay in the same place. That's what happens here, as you'll see. So, let's say we have a virus and there's a host antiviral protein. The, the host protein is is a good fit for the virus. But as you know, viruses can change and evade the host protein, but then the host will change in turn. It will take longer, but the host can change. That's viral and host evolution. That is the host virus arms race. And we can see it. We can see it by sequencing uh, host and viral genomes. Uh, for example, uh, here is a primate phylogeny, right? The relatedness of different primate species. We can take a gene uh, and look at the sequences of, of the ortholog in all of these species. And we look for evidence for positive selection, that is, codons that, over this evolutionary tree, seem to be maintained. And the idea would be they're positively selected by a virus. So then you could identify lineages in which positive selection occurs and even the amino acids involved. And the way you do this is by looking at synonymous and non-synonymous changes. You have a computer program identify the ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous changes. Right? A synonymous change would not result in a codon difference, in an amino acid difference. Uh, a uh, non-synonymous change would result in one. And you look for high values here in this phylogeny to identify these positively selected codons. And then you can do experiments to say, does that amino acid make a difference in a virus cell culture system? And over time, this has been done in many labs. This is one of the things that Nels Eldi does. Uh, Harmit Malik and others do this. We can see that these conflicts, these virus host conflicts, have driven evolution of the immune system. So here are two proteins of the immune system, TRIM5-alpha, which is a, a host defense protein that um, counters retroviruses, for example. And you can see uh, positively selected amino acids in this part of the protein. And you can demonstrate that they interact with the HIV. And you can have different ver versions of that amino acid position and show they do or do not interact with the HIV capsid, showing, depending on where you are in the primate phylogeny, a the ability to restrict the virus or not. So those are positively selected amino acids. This, this protein, PKR, which we talked about some time ago. Now remember, PKR is a very powerful antiviral protein. It, it works by shutting down translation. And look at all the positively selected amino acids that have been identified throughout this protein. There's the RNA binding domain. There's the kinase domain. By different viruses, herpes viruses, influenza pox, hepatitis C, uh, other pox viruses, HIV even. So this is a host defense protein uh, that can be countered by viral proteins. We, we discussed how uh, that happened um, when we talked about this uh, in that session. And so there are multiple viral defense proteins that are interacting with PKR in different places. And that interface changes over time in both the virus and the host. So this is, this is a fascinating aspect that's only been recently enabled by um, technology. I like this example of uh, virus host races. This is the transferrin-1 receptor. Uh, this is a cell surface protein, which is a receptor for the protein transferrin, which in turn binds iron. This is how iron gets into the cell. So it's an essential host protein. And over time, uh, it's been shown that there are positively selected amino acids in the transferrin receptor that have been selected uh, in, in different regions. And the pressure has been, at least in mouse cells, for two different uh, viruses of mice, an arena virus and mouse mammary tumor virus. So these, uh, you can see here, the separate um, parts of the uh, transferrin receptor, the, the red asterisks, or positive selection caused by the two different Viruses and in fact, the arena virus binding site is. These are this is the receptor for these two viruses. By the way, the arena virus binds up here in the gray area, 
and MMTV binds in the blue area. And so the changes of the transferrin receptor are in areas that bind the virus. So this is an example of how the receptor and the host can change to evade the virus. And of course, the virus will change to re-engage the receptor as well. Uh, the, the transferrin binding region is down here, so none of these changes affect transferrin, which is good, right? Because you need to preserve transferrin for the host. And so maybe the protein has evolved over time to allow it to be modular in this way to separate the two. Now, we've talked about a lot of genome diversity, um, yet there are still only three serotypes of poliovirus. We do have over 150 rhinoviruses. We have one measles serotype, one only. The vaccine against measles still works for 50 years, but continuous influenza variation. And so that's an interesting difference. Why do some viruses undergo antigenic, extensive antigenic change and others do not? Probably they all undergo some small amount of antigenic change. I think the experiments have shown that polio and measles can undergo antigenic change in the lab, but they rarely do so in humans. And maybe there are structural reasons for that. Maybe lab cells don't approximate the, the pressures that we see in humans. All right, let's talk about virulence as a selection. Can it be that virulence would be selected? Would it be a positive or negative trait? So a positive trait would mean uh, you get selection for increased virulence, which, as you know, I pointed out earlier, people seem to be obsessed with. And I think not. I think the, there is no reason for a virus to be selected to be more virulent unless that is a consequence of some other property that is selected for. You could imagine that, for example, uh, a virus variant could be selected that gives higher viral loads in the respiratory tract. That would facilitate transmission. I think transmission is certainly a selective trait for viruses, um, although we don't have a lot of good evidence for it. But if you needed more loads to facilitate transmission, then you could imagine seeing more virulent viruses. Now, I must say, I see no good evidence for this in human viruses whatsoever. Uh, perhaps so in animal viruses. Now, virulent selection could be a negative trait. Um, if the hosts die too quickly and reduce transmission, then and high virulence would be a negative trait and it would be selected against. Uh, I am doing some thought experiments here. We don't have answers to any of this. Or virulence could be a neutral trait. Um, Increased or dis decreased virulence itself may not be selected, but it may be a consequence of a different phenotype. I think it's probably a combination of both. There are many virulent viruses that have been in humans for a long time, like measles and poliovirus. They're still quite virulent. And there are lots of viruses that exist with us. They're avirulent. And so we don't really know the trajectory of either of them. But we do have one wonderful, famous experiment on the evolution of virulence, and that is the Australian rabbit experiment, which provides some insight into this question. Now, in 1859, the European rabbit was introduced into Australia for hunting. Right? They wanted to hunt rabbits. The, the Australian rabbits were too fast or too evasive. And uh, there were no predators of the European rabbit. So in a very short time, these guys reproduced to plague proportions, as you can see in this uh, famous photograph. Rabbits, rabbits everywhere. So they decided to control the population of rabbits by releasing a virus, Myxoma virus. This was done in the 1950s. Now, the natural host is the cottontail rabbits uh, of a Myxoma, where it doesn't cause severe disease. It's spread by mosquitoes, and the cottontails get warts on their ears. But European rabbits it, there's a very different outcome. The infection is fatal. So they said, all right, let's, let's release this and kill most of the rabbits off. So uh, the virus was released. In the first year, it killed uh, with a mortality rate of 99.8%. Uh, after the second year, the mortality dropped to 30%. And there, the rate of killing was lower than the reproductive rate of the rabbits. And so we could, they could not eliminate the rabbits because of this. So the rabbits changed, actually, and the virus changed. And studies subsequently on both the rabbit genome and the virus genome showed this. Uh, the virus became less virulent. And the rabbits, be, those, you know, that 0.2% of rabbits who survived 
Uh, they were more resistant. They had changes in various immune genes that made them more resistant to infection. So this is a study on the evolution of virulence. Both the rabbits and the viruses make a lot of offspring, so you can see it in real time. Uh, variants were selected of the virus that kill fewer rabbits, and those rabbits infected lived longer, so the virus could last over the winter and spread in the spring by mosquitoes. And the virus, the rabbits themselves evolved to be more tolerant. And this is what we would predict for an evolving host to come into equilibrium with the pathogen. Uh, this is a hypothesis. This is the only data that I that I know of which really is in support of that. And we don't have similar work in humans, although we could now because we, we know from the beginning SARS-CoV-2 and we can track it over time. And if we had a good animal model, we could look at its virulence. Uh, by the way, uh, Australia likes to use, at least try to use viruses to uh, cure some of their problems. There was another issue where herpes viruses got out of, um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, carp got out of the farms in Australia by, by flooding. They got into the local rivers and they overpopulated them. So they wanted to use a herpes virus to, to get rid of them. And they, they decided not to because they would know what to do with all the dead the dead fish. So do we have any information about viral virulence in humans? Not a lot, but I'll tell you that, you know, when we see new spillovers from animal, non-human animals, Lassa virus, Ebola virus, HIV, these, these viruses are virulent in humans. Um, viruses from older jumps, some of them are less virulent, but we don't know what the original spillover was. It could have been much more. Uh, smallpox continues to to be virulent uh, up till its eradication, it still killed 30% of people. Um, and so we don't have early samples in which to study that. We don't know what happened from the original jump. And I, so I say SARS-CoV-2, we have an opportunity to study this because we have captured it from the very spill, first spillover into humans, uh, not the very first, but close to it within at least a few months, right? We don't have that for HIV and uh, haven't done it for influenza virus. So we may be able to get some data on virulence. But let me say that this is not going to be answered within a week. You know, within a week of Omicron's emergence, they were concluding it was less virulent, to which I say impossible. You cannot conclude that by observational studies in hospitals in less than a week. You need to do lab experiments, and that's going to take some time. But we are obsessed with virulence. If you go back over time over all the outbreaks, there's always a headline about virulence. Michael Osterholm is particularly guilty of this. He, he famously said in, in 2014 that Ebola virus would go airborne. And since it's already virulent, that would be scary. Uh, a, a virologist working on the West African Ebola outbreak wondered if the virus is getting better as it goes from person to person. That was wrong. But, you know, this is a case. And there's Richard Preston reporting that, who is, wrote a nice book of fiction himself. Peter Hotez talking about Zika virus. The most plausible explanation for its rise is that the virus mutated. Well, it didn't. We actually did experiments in my laboratory, Amy Rosenfeld, showed that this virus was always in, able to infect neural cells from the very beginning. So it's very easy to blame mutation, but usually there are other explanations, which we will uh, show you next time for poliovirus when we talk about emerging viruses. And as I said, the variants of concern all suggested to have increased virulence, or now with Omicron, decreased virulence, all unproven, all based on observational studies that are all fraught with error and do not represent experimental studies and I collect a few I collect these headlines this is from the very beginning of the COVID Do you guys remember January 2020 I was teaching this course at Columbia and I was collecting these headlines coronavirus could mutate really it could couldn't it some 440 cases confirmed so far wow early days and the minister of vice minister of health there's the possibility of viral mutation um, okay I don't need to say any more about that right we basically don't have any data on the evolution of virulence in humans. We might collect it for SARS-CoV-2. I hope the right experiments are done. And we, I would say that transmission is, is a major selective force for evolution. 
Uh, but we have yet to identify changes that uh, impact the intrinsic transmissibility of a virus. Now, someone asked earlier, how would you prove that? It's very hard to prove. You can't do the experiments in humans. For example, you have a change in the virus that seems to have been selected. D614G was the first spike change of SARS-CoV-2 identified February 2020 that then propagated throughout the world. And, you know, there's it obviously conferred fitness, but why... Did it confer greater transmissibility? Is it just replicating better? Is it, it's not immune evading. So you have to do experiments in the lab. You have to have a good animal model, and we don't always have that. So that is why we may not have answers about these two. Uh, so I'll just repeat my mantra. SARS-CoV-2 variants have increased fitness, and this can be conferred by changes in many things, including reproduction, not only the levels, but the kinetics could account for some of the properties of Delta. This needs to be carefully examined in the lab. There have been already some experiments which show Delta replication in, in respiratory epithelial cells of humans uh, does not differ from the ancestral virus. So that's a, that's a tough situation to be in. You're not going to get a simple answer. Transmission could be part of it, but you'd have to show that the intrinsic transmissibility of the virus has changed. You need to do that using animal models, which may or may not mimic what happens in people. Immune evasion could do it as well. My point is fitness can be influenced by many phenotypes of the virus. We don't know which one does it for the variants of concern, and no epidemiological explanation is going to address that. All right, let's do some more questions. And this could be running a little longer today. I will do my best to uh, curtail it in respect for your time. Let's go back to uh, the last question. And I'm going to skip some um, out of uh, just, just so we get through this. H1, H3 can affect humans, but it's not. is it not possible that H4, 5, et cetera, could mutate? Yeah, yeah, sure, it's possible. Nothing's impossible with mutation, right? But we haven't seen it yet. So H5, we've been monitoring for ages, and it has not changed to be able to infect humans. So at some point, you have to decide whether such a change would be compatible with fitness or not. Um, but yeah, sure, it's possible. Why not? I would say antibody evasion is part of the fitness scenario. It doesn't affect the intrinsic transmissibility of the virus. And as you say, this is what Ron Fouché and Kawaoka studied. Fitness, well, I wouldn't say they're, tri they're trivial, but what they did was infect ferrets in, in adjacent cages with avian H5N1, which doesn't transmit among the ferrets, but they could select for transmissible variants by passage among ferrets and a few mutations, a few change, spike changes, amino acid changes in the hemagglutinin could do that. But so that's, that is what fitness is in my view, the ability or not to, to transmit in a laboratory situation. And so we could say, do those amino acid changes arise in people in, in H5N1 viruses in nature? Um, but we haven't seen them so far, but that's how you define fitness exactly. Hopefully there will be impossible and beyond pork. So, yes, in fact, one of the goals of Pat Brown's company that makes impossible burgers is to replace chicken and pork. And we get ourselves in trouble by growing so many chickens and pigs for protein because of not only the, the, the viruses that we talk about, but other issues related to global ecology. Um, so... Yeah, so, so if we don't consume pigs, bear, birds, and bats, no pandemics. Well, I don't think you're going to get rid of the birds, but the chicken farming could be reduced. The, the pig farming, I think, is a big deal. That, that contributes to a lot of issues. But um, I don't know if uh, that would solve it, but I think we ought to try. With, I mean, I, I hear these impossible uh, pork and chicken are, taste great. I'd like to try it. But there's always someone who... <laughs> Who doesn't like it, right? Uh, host virus back and forth. Can we see SARS-CoV-2 alpha again? And uh, they're going to say it's more transmissible. So you could. I don't see why not, right? 
because alpha was displaced by something else, not Omicron. And it could be that in an Omicron alpha world, maybe alpha would win. So, yeah, you can go back. As I said, there's no trajectory. But, you know, they're using the T word to mean displacement of a previous one because all these infections would still occur. Right? You have, a, you have infections happening at, in Ithaca, at Cornell. These are unvaccinated people because they're testing everybody, which, you know, the vaccines don't prevent infection. So it's Omicron because that's more fit. It's displacing Delta. It's not because Omicron is particularly good at infecting vaccinated individuals. It's because it's more fit. It's simply the right place at the right time, right? Why only one measles serotype? Well, some experiments have shown that the, the glycoprotein of measles can't change. If you do try and change it in the laboratory, uh, the, the viruses you make are, are less fit. Uh, and, and it's so they, they change the whole measles glycoprotein. It can sustain some changes, but we never see those. So apparently in, in people, they're not fit. Whereas other viruses can change. Influenza virus spike, SARS-CoV-2 spike. They're more plastic, I like to say. Why has this happened only in Australia? Because that's where they use viruses to try and get rid of rabbits and other species. I don't think other people tried it. Uh, and you have to ask your Australians about why they would do that. I'm not sure. <laughs> what, what global population vaccination would give us hope that further variants? Uh, it's a good question. But right now, many countries have less than 10% vaccination. So we still have many, many people who are susceptible. I think we need 80% higher global immunity to, to cut down on, on reproduction and therefore variant generation. So no longer use mutant as an insult for rude humans. Just say they're a snip. How about that? Was SARS-CoV-2 initially capable of infecting deer and cats or was there a second job? Well, I, I think... At least, I think the the virus could could cross over, and then variants were selected that were better able to re reproduce in um, in those other species. And I think at least for for deer mice, the uh, ancestral virus can infect them in the laboratory without changes. Yeah. How important is passive technology terminology when talking about viruses? Yeah, so this is a problem is that it's not active because it's a passive event. The virus isn't doing anything. So I do not like when people say the virus evolved to become antibody resistant. It implies active. Well, that, this is a very subtle difference there. So, But I'm glad you're thinking about it. That's exactly what the issue is. What's your opinion about SARS-CoV-2? Is it natural? I'm oh, sorry, the, the leaf blowers are right next to me now. I apologize. Of course it's natural. It, it came from a probably a bat or some other intermediary. Where? We don't know. It didn't come from a lab. What do I know about the deer zombie virus? You may be thinking about uh, prions of deers. We're going to talk about that uh, in next week's lecture. Yeah. All right, let's stop for now <coughs> and um, stop the timer, get back to the... All right, let's, let's end up by talking about uh, the origin of viruses. Uh, we don't have fossils, right? Well, at least we don't have very old viral fossils. The oldest viral stocks of humans are the 1918 influenza virus and we were able to rescue a um, giant virus from Siberian permafrost that's about 30,000 years old. It was actually infectious uh, and when they thawed the ice uh, they could infect amoeba in the laboratory. So that's not very old in geological time, right? Not at all. But we can get around it. We can do things like use molecular clocks. We can relate the time scale of say a viral 
evolution with that of the host. We have lots of viral isolates. We can measure how fast the viruses evolve, and we can compare it with that of the host. And so with this, we can say that the three major groups of herpes viruses, the alpha, beta, and gamma herpes viruses, uh, probably arose about 180 to 220 million years ago. And that, of course, was a time when uh, they were dinosaurs. <laughs> um, so dinosaurs may have had cold sores. Who knows? But that has its limits. We can do other things. We can look at pieces of viral genomes that have been integrated into host genomes. Now, you know from our previous sessions that retroviruses can integrate into uh, host genomes. And uh, they provide a way of, for us to uh, do what's called phylogenomics. Uh, we can look at the integration sites of those viruses. And by the way, other pieces of other viral genomes get integrated randomly and accidentally. They have no relationship to viral reproduction cycles, but they're just incorporated. And you can find those in, in uh, genomes of animals. And the more and more species we sequence the genomes of, we find these and we can do dating of various sorts. And this is happening uh, more and more. We did a wonderful paper on TWIV recently where they did it uh, to look at viruses um, in cetaceans and where they came from. So here we have an example where we're looking at species of rabbits. We have species A, B, and C. And this endogenous viral element we can see in species A and B but not C. And in, furthermore, the integrated Eve is present in the same chromosomal location in species A and B. So then we look at the phylogenetic tree of these rabbits. They all, all three had a common ancestral host, which then diverged. And the A and B uh, came from a common ancestor and the C from a separate branch. So this tells us that the integration of this Eve happened uh, you know, somewhere after the split of these two lineages, but before the split of A and B. And depending on your timing, you could, this could be closer 30, it could be say 50 million years ago with an error of 30 to 30 million years or so. But you get an idea of when these viruses were around. And so this has been done for a number of viruses. Here are some single-stranded DNA virus integrations. Again, these are random accidental integrations. And we can look at parvoviruses, dependoviruses, circoviruses in various species. And look, I mean, look at this. This is 30 million years ago, 60. This is when these pieces of DNA went into the genomes of these various species. So those viruses were around back then, for sure. And probably longer, of course, but well, we're limited by the data that we have. Uh, the oldest estimate of viruses that I know of is this study uh, where they looked at uh, retroviruses uh, in the ocean in, in, in uh, organisms that are in the ocean. And by doing a similar phylogeny as I just described for the rabbits, um, it, it looks like some retroviruses originated in the oceans about 450 uh, million years ago, which would be in the Ordovician period here when we just had the first uh, land plants. We already had fishes. Uh, and so fishes are probably where many viruses originated. Uh, and then, um, of course, the fishes came back to land and they brought viruses with them. Uh, and then some of them went back into the oceans and brought the viruses back with them. So um, 450 million years ago, but probably they were around longer. There were likely viruses of fishes. And I, I like to think there were viruses before cells, these single, these self-replicating uh, RNA molecules that... Um, were the precursors of viruses, which we'll talk about right now. So I think if you look at the, the, the early view for the origin of viruses, this is from a lovely review paper from uh, Eugene Koonin. I really, I really think that um, you should have a look at some of the TWIVs we did with Eugene Koonin. They're just fascinating. Anyway, so one idea here is that there's a pre-cellular stage of life, right? So we have modern cells. But before that, there was, in evolutionary time, protocells and then precellular era where we had replicons. We had nucleic acids that could reproduce. And 
these include these were initially uh, RNA, and at some point proteins uh, had to become present. And, and the RNA recognition module is thought to be an ancestral ancient protein, and many enzymes like reverse transcriptase and polymerase has probably evolved from it. But you had an early stage with many replicons, and eventually, in ways we don't understand, cells began to form. They may have been initially based on RNA, but then you know, reverse transcriptase must have arisen at one point that made DNA from RNA, and then the DNA-based cells arose and they could become uh, larger and more complex. Now, um, the, these replicons then invaded these protocells because it's a hospitable environment for them to reproduce. They stole genes from the cell, uh, and those genes became capsid proteins, for example, various sorts, capsid or nucleocapsid proteins. And then these viruses evolved with the cells over time. The cells acquired nuclei. We had different kinds of viruses uh, ev changing with the cell. And so this be be brings us our modern cell and the virusphere. So this is one idea. The root of everything are these replicons very early on. And as I said, the RNA world, uh, it, there is a, there is evidence for it today in, in many uh, catalytic aspects of RNA, uh, not only the ribosome, but self-splicing RNAs and, and viroids. So we can now uh, see where many viruses came from. Um, this is a scenario of RNA virus evolution. Um, we, we, again, starting from the earliest RNAs, and their, their earliest hosts would have been bacteria or archaea. Um, we have early on reversed transcribing viruses, the evolution of uh, the ancestral. In fact, reverse transcriptase was probably first, and then the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase evolved from uh, these ancestral viruses. And then these, these genomes probably invaded uh, eukaryotes. Uh, you know, many, the mitochondria, uh, chloroplasts are evolved from bacteria that invaded those hosts. Um, and levy viruses uh, are viruses of uh, bacteria whose relatives persist uh, in eukaryotic hosts, some of them associated with the mitochondria. Uh, and these viruses steal capsid proteins from the host. That's what the CP means. And these are all different lines of RNA virus evolution for which there's evidence uh, looking at uh, the origin of these capsid proteins and so forth and other enzymes and other proteins that are viral but stolen from the host cell. Uh, what I think is interesting, I want to point out here is that, so here we have bacterial archaeal hosts, here we have eukaryotic hosts. Um, they were initially plus-stranded uh, RNA viruses and, and also double-stranded RNA viruses that evolved from the ancestral uh, eukaryotic, uh, eukaryotic RNA virus, which have been, came from bacterial viruses. And the negative strand uh, RNA viruses evolved from a double-stranded RNA virus. So these did not come up on their own initially. They were probably first plus-stranded RNA viruses. All this green color is the plus RNA. And those um, um, became double-stranded and then negative-stranded. So there's there's invasion of eukaryotes, stealing of, of uh, capsid proteins and so forth. We can also do the same for DNA viruses, um, which we think originated as self-replicating plasmids. Uh, you know, these invaded hosts and stole capsid proteins. Jelly roll capsid protein is one kind of motif in the structure of viruses that were stolen from hosts. And we can actually uh, track all of these to see the formation of single-stranded DNA viruses, uh, uh, double-stranded DNA viruses as well. So uh, all evolving from self-replicating DNAs uh, in hosts that stole capsid proteins to become viruses. So you see the theme here is that we start with replicons of either DNA or RNA, but uh, they steal capsid proteins, and that makes their reproduction more efficient. Now, what about human viruses? Um, I think it's fair to say that all the known types of viruses that we have today probably evolved long before humans arrived on Earth. So here we have each sapiens here and all our uh, ancestral versions uh, millions of years ago here. So I would say all human viruses have evolved from animal viruses, nothing de novo uh, in humans. Uh, and so we either get viruses from other animals now and have been for as long as we're homo sapiens. We probably got some from Neanderthals and we probably inherited some from our ancestors as well. 
We'll actually look at that in some detail uh, on Monday. So what about how, how limitless is evolution? So let's, um, let's assume that new viruses can only arise from the ones that we have now. They're not going to ri- arise de novo. Not, not some brand new virus with a unique genome configuration is not going to arise de novo. But we have a lot of uh, material to work with here. So then we can ask, what's the number of possible mutations of a viral genome? We can, we can approximate that. Um, sequence comparisons of um, a, a number of RNA virus genomes have shown that over half of the nucleotides can actually accommodate mutations. So half, let's say half of the genome can accommodate mutations. So for a 10 KB viral genome, that means there are four to the 5,000 sequences possible. So we're, we're assuming half. And then this would be increased by deletions, recombination, reassortment. This is huge. The number of atoms in the visible universe is 4 to the 135. This is huge. So the possibility is really endless. However, there are constraints. The fundamental properties of viruses constrain their evolution. We can see a herpes virus. We can see an influenza virus by sequence analysis. And, you know, herpes doesn't become something else, even though they could because there's a lot of opportunity for mutation. So how is this stability maintained? Well, there are many ways. I think the bottom line is extreme alterations in the genome don't survive selection. Uh, The genome is one constraint. DNA doesn't become RNA. Replication requires interactions with certain proteins. You can't change that. There are all kinds of signals in the genome that need to be conserved. The physical nature of the capsid, right? Icosahedra have defined internal spaces. That fixes the genome size so it can't get increasingly larger. And during the host, right? A, a mutant that's too efficient in bypassing defenses will kill the host and it will not survive, just like one that doesn't replicate survive. So there are all kinds of constraints that tell us that that 4 to the 5,000 is a, an overestimate of the possibilities, and that brand-new viruses are simply not going going to emerge. So I'll leave you with this, one of my favorite slides. You know, it took 8 million years uh, to have a 2% divergence in the genome of of humans and chimps, and the same 2% occurs in five days from the moment you ingest poliovirus to the time it comes out in your stool. The same amount of genetic change happens in five days, 2%. Imagine what a virus can do with 8 million years. On Monday, we're going to talk about emerging viruses. You now have some tools to understand how new viruses emerge from animals or among animals uh, and to other populations. That's a fun one. Well, they're all fun. Uh, Let's see. I'll just take a few minutes here to uh, answer some questions, and I know many of you have to go. And, uh, and and moderators, you know, I appreciate your patience. New Zealand also used myxoma to control rabbits with the same result. Yes, you cannot get around biology, right? Uh, yeah, so next week we have uh, emergence and then, I guess, unusual infectious agents. Then No, no, we have HIV, then unusual infectious agents, and then therapeutic viruses. Are, am I in favor of using viruses to control populations? I don't think you can do it for po- controlling animal populations because of the evolution. You just don't know where things are happening. And for, no, for warfare, well, I, I think warfare is absurd in general. It doesn't work very well. It's not a weapon that you can control. There, there are other weapons that people have. They're called bombs that work much better. Uh, Siberia and the Arctic are being defrosted, so we may get to peer into the viral Wayback Machine. What a great title for a TWIV. Thank you. I love it. The Viral Wayback Machine. Can viral genomes be recovered from insects in amber? Oh, I should know the answer. Has that been done? I, I don't know. I, I'm sure someone has tried. I have to look at that. That's really interesting. Uh, 
During the lab leak, a scientist uh, claimed that serial passage could have resulted in SARS. She said this was BS. Uh, there, there are many reasons why it's BS because you'd have to have something really close to SARS-CoV-2, first of all, and we, we don't. Nobody had anything close to it. That's why it was a brand new discovery. And so nobody was passaging this in the laboratory. If you took the closest bad virus, which was RATG13 at the time, uh, you'd have to passage it for 20 years and maybe you wouldn't end up getting it. Why would passing it in the cell uh, do that? makes no sense whatsoever. A cell is not a person, right? Hey, Animal Party, good to see you briefly. See you tonight. Uh, do all viruses have a common ancestor? Yes, I believe they do. Now, that's a hypothesis, right? I think they all originated from some, well, I would say in the replicon phase. Uh, currently, viruses are not monophyletic, which would be a common ancestor. But that's simply because they've diversified so much over the years that you can't track it. I mean, there are a couple of conserved proteins, and Eugene Koonin will tell you that. But as you go far back, the, it gets the, the data become very fuzzy. But they probably all started a long time ago from uh, common replicon ancestors. RNA can be reduced, reproduced by a cell, but it does not reproduce by itself, or does it? Well, um, <clears throat> people have actually done that experiment. You can make RNA-like molecules that are self-replicating. And so the, the assumption is that they existed at some point. Uh, but currently, um, the RNAs that we know of are all reproduced by protein enzymes. Yeah. Are currently circulating retroviruses more recent? So HIV certainly jumped into people around 1920. I don't know about HTLV. Could be older. But yeah, that's very young. Yeah, but we still don't have early samples to compare it to. Uh, but why would there be no de novo viruses? I don't, I, because... Um, I think they all originated from a common ancestor and the problems that were addressed during their evolution have been solved. So we don't have any of those replicons anymore to start the whole process going. And I don't think you can mutate from what we have into something completely different. That was the point of that one slide that I showed you. Going from the DNA RNA world to reverse transcription to DNA seems like a humongous leap. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I put billions of years of evolution in a, in a short amount of time. It's kind of absurd, right? Because, and I asked Eugene Kuhn, so when did proteins emerge? And, uh, he said, that's a good idea. Good question. Did you have proteins before cells or after cells? So a lot of interesting questions there for sure. Thank you for Barb for your uh, uh, contribution. Really appreciate it. Is some human evolution caused by virus? Yes, that's, that was the point of the host virus arms race, right? We, the viruses have driven evolution of immune proteins, of defense proteins, and vice versa. Absolutely. And it's probably beyond that, beyond immune proteins, because that's the easy example that we have to, uh, to look at, right? All right, folks, uh, all the rest is thanking me. So I want to thank the mods here today, Vanity Nutrition, uh, Les, Steph, Mr. Ozzy Cam, and um, also uh, who is here not very often, so I can't remember her name. So I'm going to find it. There she is, Feruza. Thank you all for moderating. I appreciate your efforts. And thank you for your contributions. They went down today because everyone found out that most of it goes to YouTube. So support us elsewhere. There are other ways that you can do that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, be safe. Thanks for coming. I appreciate your interest. Uh, and we will see you on Monday. Bye-bye.